So I, the first thing I want to say is, for me, it's just an honor to be here uh, with you all. And I, I have this huge, monstrous esteem for John Carlson. So I feel like, you know, any pulpit, any sanctuary is holy ground, but it feels like it's especially holy ground. You know, the, the, the pulpit of John Carlson. And just to say, to let you know, so the reason that we did this switch was because Nestle Mennonite Church, as we head into this meeting next weekend, where the church is going to vote on membership guidelines. Nestville's got this, you know, this rumbling thing about, you know, who are we? Who do we want to be? Is this Anabaptist thing important to us? So we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and I wanted John to come and share his story of becoming an Anabaptist with my church. And I told John that I was willing to preach here, so I gave him very clear instructions. His instructions to me were, preach about whatever you want to preach about, which is a little bit dangerous for him it dawned on me that I can say whatever I want to today, and only John gets in trouble. <laughs> so I'm feeling kind of free. So the reality is, one of the thoughts that went through my mind, when, when I preach about what I want to preach about, I hope you all are interested. We will see how it goes. For the last year, uh, yeah, I would say year to two years, not really having anything to, to do with COVID, I don't think, I have been reading books about the brain and how our brain works. I can't actually imagine anything that might be any more boring than that if I think about it. When it comes out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, how boring is the brain? But to me, it's this super exciting, amazing thing. And things that we've been learning about the brain, they've been learning that our brains are like shaping and forming all the time. Like the idea that you can't teach an old dog new tricks is completely false because our brain is being shaped and formed by who we are, by what we experience, and by our relationships. All the time, our brain is being formed. So this is how crazy it is. The, the, when I read this, I, I just about lost it. Um, I'm probably boring you already, but we'll, I'll try and keep my vocal variety good and strong to keep you engaged. So they found out that there's like a, there is Republican-shaped brain, and there's Democrat-shaped brain. And so I was like, what in the world? What do we do with this? And then I found myself being drawn to this scripture. And I thought, did Paul know things? Like 2,000 years before the doctors start figuring out what's going on in our brain, as Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that have to say for us, and what does it teach us today? So I, the more I study this scripture, the more it just it hits home for me. So hopefully you can come along with me on the journey. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it starts with this. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of Christ, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In the view of God's mercy, everything has to start right there. We think that we choose God, but we only choose God after God has called us. We follow Jesus because Jesus has invited us. The very beginning of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God. This is where it all starts. And Paul is saying, in light of God's mercy, in light of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for you and for me, we ought to offer our bodies as living sacrifice. We should give ourselves to the ministry of the church. Then he says this, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. What are the main ideologies? What are the patterns of this world? What is he talking about? When I think about, when I think about the patterns of the world, I think the world tells us, and I think we can see this, you can see it on your phones, when you're flipping through Instagram, I know all of you do that. Or if you're watching television, you see the commercials that you watch or conversations that we have about politics, about church, about all sorts of things. I think the world continues to tell us that if we don't bless ourselves, no one else will. That we need to take control of our lives and the things around us. As a matter of fact, when Paul tells us that we're supposed to give our bodies as a living sacrifice, the world is telling us 
that the last thing we should do is make sacrifices. When a parent says, and I've said this, my hope or my goal for my children is that they will have a better life than I did. What we're really saying is, my hope is that my children don't have to make the same sacrifices that I made. This is the way the world talks to us. Now, when Paul's talking about the world, he's talking about principalities and powers. He's talking not about the global world, but he's talking about a secular world, a pagan world that's speaking into our lives, creating patterns all the time. So the brain, this is how the brain works, going back to the brain stuff. We intake all this stuff about how we are the most important thing, and it forms and shapes our brains. And I think a lot of us, myself included, probably have a me-shaped brain. Now, none of the doctors or the books that I read have said that there's such thing, but I think there's got to be such thing as a me-shaped brain. And Paul talks about the patterns. The brain loves patterns. The brain loves to just take us down a path. So anybody here have dogs? Dogs. We've got some dog people, a few dog people. I have two monstrous dogs. We live on my grandparents' farm. We have 94 acres. But these dogs are so patterned. They have 94 acres to run on, and they will not go 20 feet away from our house unless we take them with us. Unless we give them permission to go for a walk with us. Their brains are so patterned. 94 acres, and they make trails. They have paths through my grass, my grass, and they make these trails and, in my opinion, ruin the way that things look. It's all about me. It's not about my dogs. But we have these patterns, too. We have the same patterns. So when I go to my mom's house, the immediate the first thing that I do, I go into her kitchen and I start opening cupboards. That is a pattern that I started coming home from school as a young child. And 48 years old, many, many years later, I still do it. We have these patterns. And the me-shaped brain, the patterns in the me-shaped brain says, what about me? We go to a buffet. Okay, maybe this is only me. And my brain says, is there going to be enough food for me? Maybe I need to get in that line first to make sure I get what I want. This is the way the me-shaped brain works. The me-shaped brain says, well, I'm going to give to the church, but i got to make sure I've got plenty for me. The me-shaped brain says, I'm going to give my time, but I've got to make sure I've got plenty of time for me. The me-shaped brain is always thinking, what about me? When the me-shaped brain is thinking about politics, what's the best politics for me? Paul's telling us to make sacrifices for others. What can I do, the me-shaped brain says, to avoid any sacrifice at all? The me-shaped brain says, I want to have the big house with the white picket fence, the really sweet car, the perfect job, the perfect body. The me-shaped brain is all about me. So, the next thing that happens in the midst of our brain when the me-shaped brain is completely focused and patterned upon us, we start to look at other people who might take things from us, and we see them as dangerous. And I'll tell you another thing about how the brain works. In the back of our brain, there's this place called the amygdala. You don't have to remember that name, I promise. And this is what they call the fight-or-flight center of the brain. That's the part of the brain that keeps us safe. So imagine you're walking down this well, it wouldn't be here. Imagine you're walking outside somewhere on a trail, and you see something out of the corner of your eye, and it's skinny, and it's long, and it's black, and your brain says, snake. The moment that your brain says snake, the amygdala lights up and sends endorphins all throughout the body, gets your heart pumping, so you send blood to all your extremities so you can fight the thing, grab a stick and smash that snake into pieces, or run so you don't get bitten, or freeze, don't let anybody move, so that you don't get bitten by the snake. The fight or flight center's job that God gave to it is to keep us safe. And the front part of our brain is the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that actually processes what's safe and what isn't safe. The prefrontal cortex looks down and says, Hunter, it's a bicycle tire, not a snake at all. 
And then the prefrontal cortex brings all of our stuff down, and we find nurture, and we find peace, and we find quiet, and we know that we're safe again. When the me-shaped brain looks at other people and sees danger, the fight-or-flight center kicks in, and we react. We react by pushing those people away, or we react by fighting against those people. A horrible uh, image of the me-shaped brain terribly overfunctioning was the shootings that happened in Buffalo last weekend. A white supremacist called colored people the replacers. The replacers are going to take my money. The replacers are going to take my job. The replacers are going to take all of my stuff from me. And so the fight or flight center kicked in and he fought. That's like the worst scenario that could possibly happen. The other thing is that our brains can have a long-term exposure of the fight or flight center that brings anxiety and depression and all sorts of problems. And I believe, and we'll argue, that the last two years, many of us have spent a great deal of time, way too much time, firing from the fight or flight center. Maybe we're the person wearing the mask saying, those non-mask wearing people are going to kill me. Or maybe we're the non-mask wearing person looking at the people with masks and saying, those people are going to take away all my freedoms. We hear the language again. It's all about me. And it's all about the danger. How do we connect with the prefrontal cortex and say, am I really in danger right now? So I, I wasn't sure if I was going to say this. People at Nestle know anytime I'm not sure if I'm going to say something, that pretty much as assures that I'm going to say it. But so I'm reading all these books about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala and all these different things. And I, so it was one night, well, actually three nights that I can think of in the back of my mind that I, you know, I got up and I went to the bathroom. That's what old people do. And sometimes when I, that happens, I wake up, I lay back down in bed, and suddenly the fight or flight center starts kicking in. Maybe something happened that week that made me feel unsafe. Maybe someone said something to me at church that wasn't the kindest thing, or maybe someone left the church, or there's something going on, I just have this thing, and I've got it, and, and I start thinking, I don't know if this happens to anybody else. I start thinking about all the things I should have said, or the things I should have done, and I'm laying there, and before you know what happens, it'll be like three hours later, I'm still awake. Three times now, that started to happen, and I said, Jesus, please engage my prefrontal cortex, and I was asleep 30 seconds later. It's amazing, but true. One time it didn't work because I was angry about two things, and I started ping-ponging them back and forth, and the prefrontal cortex just couldn't handle it. So the real question is, how do we renew our minds. When Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, of course, the first thing he says to us, don't think so highly of yourself. It's just in case you thought that I was making up this idea of the patterns of the world all by myself, Paul confirms. The problem with the world is that it's all about me. And then he goes on to tell us that we need to engage all these different people. So, okay. The beauty of renewing our mind, the amazing and wonderful, glorious thing about renewing our mind is that this is stuff that we probably do already and talk about in church all the time. One of the steps to renewing the mind is taking time in silence. Prayer, quiet. We talked about it this morning. Jesus went off to pray. Literally, when we take time to stop to drink a cup of coffee, to go for a walk with someone we care about, to just sit. Our brain is the opportunity to reorganize itself, to settle down, to breathe. I believe God created us with all of this on purpose. Another way that we reorganize our mind is studying the Bible. The world's telling us all this stuff that we should believe about me and all the stories about Jesus in the Bible are about sacrifice, about other people, about loving our neighbors, about serving people, about clothing people, about giving them homes, about watching out for those in prison and mothers 
and children. The whole of the Bible is this beautiful invitation to have an others-centered brain. How often are we taking in the words of the Bible, the words of Jesus? We come to this place. We come here. You all come here week after week after week to be formed, transformed by the songs that you sing, by the scriptures that are preached, by the scriptures that are read, in the children's stories, in the prayers. We're here to be formed and shaped back again to an others-shaped Jesus-shaped brain. Another thing, this is the really hard part, and I think comes back to, again, Paul talking about the body of Christ. We need to spend time with people. One of the ways the brain is shaped is through relationships. Now, I was here in your lovely church on Thursday with John as we met with Cesar Garcia, who is the executive director of Mennonite World Conference. And he talked to us. I think it was somebody, it was probably John, asked a really intelligent question about how, you know, Mennonite World Conference can help us to think about what what does it look like to unite in the midst of all of our differences. And one of the things that Cesar said, I think it goes beautifully with what we're talking about. He said, we need to spend time as followers of Jesus with other followers of Jesus who follow Jesus in different contexts that we can learn from people who follow Jesus in a context like Amsterdam, where nobody even knows what a Bible is. We can learn from people who follow Jesus in a very poor context. We can learn from people who follow Jesus in a violent, war-filled context. We can learn from each other. And then he took it a step farther and made me super uncomfortable, and he said we should look for relationships with people that are different from us, that have diverse backgrounds, and disagree with us, right? So the the back part of the lane, fight or flight says, people that think differently than me are dangerous, and I should stay as far away from them as possible. Prefrontal cortex, Jesus, Holy Spirit says, we all need each other. We need the law people. We need the grace people. I can say this here. I don't know if I'm ready to say it in Nesville. We need the people that are open and affirming to gay marriage, and we need the people who stand against it. We need each other. We need Republicans. We need Democrats. And we need to be talking to each other so that we can find compromise and connection in the midst of it all. One of the most powerful ways that we shape the brain is through our relationships especially our relationships with people that are different from us. I'll leave you with a final story, and then I'll be done. So part of my brain shaping about certain people and different things has happened over the years at conferences. And there's a particular pastor that was showing up at conferences that I was at years in the past and was someone who... Um, sort of a peace and justice advocate and, you know, was all the time up in front of the conference meetings, uh, wearing a rainbow flag or I think one time a trash bag, in my opinion, disrespectfully interrupting meetings. And I looked at this person and throughout the years, I think I pretty much more or less in my mind convinced myself that this person was dangerous. At least my, my fight or flight center said that person is dangerous. I was, a, I was at a pastoral meeting a while ago, and this person got up to the microphone. Again, I'm way too honest. I probably rolled my eyes. They started talking. They started talking about how hard COVID has been, how hard it's been for pastors. Like, how do we pastor people? We don't know who's at our church, who's not at our church. How do we decide if we're going to wear masks or not wear masks? And all this stuff, just pulling and, and prodding. And I was, I was listening to the person. I'm like, yeah, yes, I agree with all of that. So after the meeting, I met with them, and I said, hey, I just wanted to thank you for, you know, sort of naming what was in the room, uh, this tiredness. And this person and I started talking. And I don't know how it came up. It was probably me grumbling about the meetings coming up this weekend, next weekend. 
And uh, on the busiest holiday weekend of the year, holiday travel weekend of the year, uh, when I had like 15 picnics planned and have no choice to go because my church tells me I have to, I'm really excited. Can you tell? Um, so we started talking about that weekend, and, and this person just went into this story about how they were at seminary, and they were ready to give up on their faith. And a gay person invited them to a Bible study and invited them in and prayed for them and shared Jesus with them in ways that they would not experienced before. And that person said in that moment, they said, look, I can't, I can't be opposed to this. I have to stand for this. When I heard that story, I didn't change my position. I'm still pretty conservative. But I can tell you that my sense of feeling that that person was dangerous just dissipated. And I said, okay, I can be in a relationship with this person. They're not so scary. They're not so dangerous. I think I understand their position. Don't agree with it, but I understand it. Can we be in relationship? Yes. Can we walk together and worship together? For me, yes. We can do that. That happened because we shared a story, because we engaged with one another. So my encouragement for you all, as we head into these meetings, as we sort of work our way through COVID and whatever is happening, you know, I keep thinking blissfully that it's over, and then it sort of comes rearing its ugly head again, to think about where is your mind? Where are your thoughts? Are you functioning out of the fight or flight center in the back? Are you fighting, fly, functioning from the prefrontal cortex? Some call it the joy center. I think the place where we engage with God the most deeply. And can we find times and ways to renew our mind, silence, study, worship, and by engaging others? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you for Forest Hills Mennonite Church. I praise you for all these wonderful people that are here today, for those that are watching from home, and for those that are at Nesville, and for those that are at their beach houses or cabins this weekend enjoying the weather. I praise you. I praise you for the beautiful body of Christ that you have called together in this place. I praise you for all the different gifts. I praise you for all the different types of people. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be the binding agent that renews our minds, that draws us together, and leads us to be Christ-centered people, others-centered people. Empower us to follow you with all of our hearts. In the name of Christ, amen.